Welcome to Insights for Manufacturing, the podcast that supports the UK manufacturing sector. Hosted by Jeff Beecham, the manufacturer's recruiter. Hello and welcome to Insights for Manufacturing. I'm delighted to welcome my guest today, Josh Dugdale. And Josh is the head of Additive Manufacturing UK, AMUK, which is part of the Manufacturing Technologies Association. Welcome to the show, Josh. Thanks. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. We were just having a, a quick chat offline there about the rise in, in additive manufacturing and yeah, what, what a, an ever shifting sand, uh, the, the advancement in technology is phenomenal. So this is going to be a really interesting discussion. I know there's been lots of exciting things going on at your end, uh, Josh. So firstly, for the benefit of our audience, how important is additive manufacturing to the future of UK manufacturing? Oh, well, I think probably the, the, the short answer is yeah, it's critical. It's absolutely critical for the future of um, UK manufacturing. You know, additive as a as sort of as a technology as, as enables the UK manufacturing supply chain to do to be or to do so much more. Really, um, yeah. makes it more resilient. You know, they can they able to uh, you know manufacture what's needed when it's needed. It becomes you know it becomes can make it more agile, so it can respond to short term demands. I think if you you know, look back at the um sort of during the pandemic uh, period when there was lots of demand for like things like PPE and you saw these almost you know, people using the FDM printers in their garages to print off all these little parts that they that, that were needed. It's it's got an a bit sort of an ability to 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 to, to fill in sort of gaps and it gaps in this supply chain um, as required. Um you've got you know it gives you the ability to manufacture at the point of need. You don't need to have some um, you know, to, to have the almost manufacturing separated from from everyone else, you could have it. You know, you yeah. could have sort of a distributed manufacturing network ar around the UK. So you're you're printing your parts close to close to where you want them. Reduces uh, the amount of material that you you use in your manufacturing parts. As you know, uh, so you're um, you know reducing your reliance on overseas um, on overseas supply chain. So yeah, it, it, in in short, it's, it's, I think it's a, a critical technology um, for the UK manufacturing supply chain um, to adopt. And it's, yeah, one which I think we'll see continue to sort of see its use grow um, over the next few years. Brilliant. So what, why did you set up AM at, at UK as a sort of standalone or separate part of, of the Manufacturing Technologies Association? Um, so... I think it's probably actually worth going back to the sort of the origins of AM UK. Um, so AM UK was actually originally set up by the Manufacturing Technology Centre um, yep. back in 2014, and they uh, sort of uh, under their stewardship, they essentially produced a number of reports, which um, I guess culminated in their Additive Manufacturing um, UK National Strategy back in I think they, so they released that in September 2017, from which they you know a, a lot of further work was done. Um, I think fast forward a few years and the MTC sort of felt like they were running a, a network rather than doing the I guess the, the, you know they're specifically interested in um, uh, doing R&D and sort of you know research yeah, research and development around additive and they're not so interested in the, in the I guess in the network side yeah see so I'm from the working for the uh, Manufacturing Technologies Association um, we are obviously very interested in in additive and we're, we're interested in obviously running networks so there was a sort of this opportunity um i guess with yeah, with discussion with the mtc they felt like it would be a better fit sort of sitting under us yeah uh, i guess why why did we kept it slightly separate i think it's because because within the, the membership we felt like it was going to be slightly different to what we normally traditionally have at the mta so the mta we deal with manufacturing technology providers and that, that does include additive, but it's also machine tools, it's robotics, it's metrology, it's digital, it's anything you find on a, a factory floor. Yeah. The AM UK side, we felt like we wanted to deal with those guys, but also, you know, the materials, people at, at one end, people doing the post-processing. So it's all those technology suppliers of the additive, you know, additive value chain, if you like. Yeah. And, and the users and the R and D and the sort of training providers, essentially that whole additive ecosystem. So, the the, the profile of the membership is is slightly um, different. Um, I would say some of the services that we do offer across the two um, associations are slightly different, but you know there are obviously commonalities as well. So you know yeah. things like business support, um, business intelligence. There 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 is there's some that similarity in what we offer. But essentially, for AMUK, you know, we've tweaked it so that it, it fits the additive community as as they kind of they they want it or what, what or what they're interested specifically in. 
Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. It's just like, I guess yeah, slightly different communities essentially. And bespoke, so it's a it's it's totally bespoke for the AM yeah. ar- arena, really. Yeah. Brilliant. So I mean this this will probably be, I think, episode forty eight, I think, of Insights Manufacturing. So I've I've been running this since uh, about March last year so march 2022 and i previously spoke to kate black on insights for manufacturing last year uh, so kate as you know cto of meta additive and, and professor of manufacturing at the university of liverpool i understand kate's also on your is it an advisory board or yes our um, steering board yeah right okay so kate's on the steering board of of am uk so when kate was on the show one one thing that sort of sticks out for me was uh, something she said about the you know the huge advancement in the in the palette of materials available for AM and the the benefits of being able to design geometrically complex parts easier because because of the AM manufacturing process now that was you know well over 12 months ago when i had that discussion with kate where is the AM sector currently josh what well, what sort of breakthroughs are you are you seeing currently so I, I don't know if it's so much of a, 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 a i don't know if you class it as a, like a big breakthrough but there's this there's this general just a general continuation of that sort of that you know the the, the technology being developed um you know is it's the they're getting greater control of the technology which you know the make, yeah. I mean, parts that are being made of you know the more accurate the more repeatable um, and actually, what I guess what the breakthrough really is that we, we especially we've seen over the last twelve months. I, I feel I, I, I mean, this is I don't know if I've got much data to back this up, but it, it feels like there's a real transition from sort of prototyping to actual, um, you know, production parts. It's right. no longer just a a rapid prototyping sort of process, yeah, yeah or you know something to make, you might use for your tooling. But actually, people are now using it to produce parts which are going into goods and you know being used. Um, yeah, yeah. It's essentially, essentially it's that it's it's. I think I think there's been a real shift from being just a, a tool for a prototype. Also, yeah, it's actually now a manufacturing production solution that can be can be used. And I guess that would. Um, I mean, that trend's going to continue, right? I mean, uh, yeah. at what sort of pace? Who knows where this is going to lead? I mean, it, it, I, I suppose we're yeah, we're quite a few years away from you know everybody doing everything by additive manufacturing and and that wouldn't be totally appropriate anyway you know there's there's still a lot of applications that are you know suited to the the material subtraction as, as opposed to you know additive but um there's definitely going to be a, a a pickup and that can only be good for you know for for manufacturing really but i mean in terms of you know traditional supply chain models you know ams sort of having a you know a positive impact on that as you said earlier about the you know you can print parts locally to where they they might be used i mean what what impacts are you seeing from a the perspective of reshoring i mean it, it, is am playing a big part in that currently or is that still sort of growing uh, so uh, uh, yeah the answer i think is, is it's growing but it's also it's quite a it's quite complicated i think to say am, AM is positive or almost ne- negative on, on reshore especially i think from reshoring angle yeah it's, it's going to be quite a nuanced answer and depending on who you ask um they'll give a different answer um and i mean for example um i know of a an automotive oem in the based in the uk but what they're, they're doing is setting up additive hubs globally and they're you know they've got a centralized um database of parts which which they need to manufacture but they've just manufactured yeah. where they need them so it's kind of they know you know that's if you like they're they're, they're taking manufacturing out of the uk to do that but they they've got you know that that it makes sense why they're why they're doing that but i've also heard on on you know on the flip side of um so there was a, a one, one of the AMUK members they do they print actually print parts um for, for a hospital um yeah. local to them um, and basically, the, I, 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 apologies, I can't remember what the, what the part was, but I can remember sort of the story with the hospital only ever needed two two at a time of, of these parts. Um, and basically, when they when they went it there to go out, they had to order actually a, a massive quantity of them because they had to get right. injection molded. They'd have to get them in, and they have to work their way through. They have to store them. But actually, the AMUK member that was doing it, they could they could print about sixteen at a time. 
So and they could do it on demand when it was required. So it was far less storage. So it was you know oppor- that was a real opportunity for, so to bring manufacturing back to the UK. So yeah, it's 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 quite quite I think quite a nuanced subject. I think we probably need to sort of give it a bit of a longer time scale to see how how it's t- truly going to impact. Um, sort of yeah, I, I guess sort of the manufacturing supply chain and, and reshoring. I, th- I think you know the the one thing the UK can do is you know to is to really invest heavily in the technology to invest yeah. in the, the training invest in the um you know r&d D around it and to make sure that you know we're well positioned to capture um some of the, some of that um global market because the, 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 you know the, the people are going to be looking for you know for experts in it and if we can set ourselves as as that we've got you know, i think there's a real opportunity there absolutely yeah just going back just touching on something you said there about the 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 medical sort of sector with with the hospitals needing you know very very low volumes uh, of of parts or components or or instrumentation whatever it might be i mean that that in itself um the fact that you know the your your member can print you know one or two off at a time for 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 the hospitals rather than you know getting loads injection molded and then carrying stock that's going to have a good knock on effect for the nhs as well isn't it i mean you know surely they they would they would pay you know and and i don't know how the contracts work with the nhs but i mean they would probably need to you know they're going to have money tied up with with bigger inventories aren't they yeah. um it, it, again I, I i actually made the same comment and it was quite a, a new again a really new it's um uh answer actually to this because the the, the i remember actually having a conversation with the member but they were it, it's it's interestingly the nhs always talks around actually how many lives saved they're not always they're, and how many well, what's the impact on health rather than trying to save money if you, you see what i mean so it, that that's like, so it's quite it it, it's interesting because the business case you have to make is actually very different to what you would yeah. you and I might traditionally think, and so that's yeah. actually how they had to go in around it. How actually this because that that because they can um, react quicker to the requirement, it it's it, it impacts this amount on wait times and this amount on you know lives saved. That so that's actually it w- wasn't the cost that was actually the yeah the big the big thing. But I mean yeah, it does it does save money, which 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 you, you think obviously can probably go towards better healthcare um but yeah the, the, the yeah the business case wasn't wasn't quite what i had expected when i asked about it as well yeah <laughs> yeah well overall it's a win win isn't it you yeah. know because everybody wants the nhs to be functioning yeah. at, at yeah. its at its optimum um so if they can you know give people the treatment or services or uh, you know procedures mm. quicker that's great and that's what the nhs are there to do but from a you know anybody listening to the podcast will be just like you and I a taxpayer and we we all hear about this stuff in the news all the time about how much money the NH, NHS is costing the the benefits of using this AM technology kills two birds with one stone doesn't it it helps yeah. them provide the service quicker better and yeah you know frees I mean, up some of their budget as well yeah i mean uh, it, it, i've actually got some really great examples it's from from canada actually um yeah. So um, uh, in, in Canada, I think there's about six hospitals where they've actually set up within the hospital like a 3D um, printing hub. And it's wow. for all the plastic consumables that they use in hospitals and the medical parts. Yep. Um, and they actually gave me the the, the proper example of, of a bed bump. So, you know, you've got the bed, the big beds that they wheel around and they, they've got, I don't know, four or six bumps or something around the, on the corners. So when it hits the wall, it, it doesn't damage, but the yeah. bed bumps break quite often. Um, but the, so, and I was basically told that every time they have to, or they have to order a thousand bed bumps at a time and it costs them $90 per bed bump. So, you know, if, you, if you've run out, you've got to order a thousand more, it's going to be what's 90 yeah. grand. Yeah. Basically they set up this 3D printing hub. So now you, you go and basically print off there. Um, bed bumps so they don't have to store 999 of them anymore yeah and literally yes you go to a computer screen you click bed bump it two hours later i guess it appears on the desk and they can put it on and it only costs 20 dollars. you know yeah Um, yeah so i i I, you know that i'd love to see something like that in the uk it'd be because it it just it just makes sense doesn't it you know it's absolutely it's so so much more efficient than 
than that yeah that long supply chain model but having it yeah manufacturing at the point of where you actually require it which i guess kind of ties back into what, what i said at the beginning it's yeah. absolutely super i mean that's a that's a really a really interesting example so yeah. uh yeah well done to the the canadians for uh for putting that into place so let's look at um sustainability so how how is additive manufacturing contributing to sustainability within uk manufacturing i mean especially concerning things like waste reduction and you know retail resource utilization okay yeah so i think there's probably like two sides to, to, to the answer so for that so in yeah. terms of i guess waste reduction resource utilization you know additive just by the way that it functions um it's resource efficient you know the parts that you manufacture are they going to be close to the, to the shape that you finally want you know very uh, there's going to be less waste material you know you might have to do some um, post-processing afterwards but it you know the, the the part that you manufacture is going to be very near net shape and then you know it can be even that can be even further refined if you know you've designed your parts specifically for additive you know the the, the amount of resource uh, or waste materials get going to be really minimal yeah uh, got a really good actually, example actually and um, i don't think they'd mind me sharing around hp so one of the amuk members um <clears throat> and i apologize i can't remember what the part was for but i know they had a part on one of their printers and it was i think it was a combination of 16 different parts it weighed i don't know something like half a kilo or something it was yeah. you know machined metal it was, it was quite a complex piece they, they'd put together um and then they basically went through sort of this iteration design process, got it down to one single printed part, and it was a, 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 you know about ten percent of the weight. It, it would yeah. they don't had to do all these. It, so it was it, it you know it, it can save so much in terms of um, material resource. And um, with regards, I guess to more of the I guess sustainability side around energy use. Um, I, I, I don't know if like it, it, it's always correct to compare additive with say machining or, or some other manufacturing process. I think actually what you know there's cases where AM it's what you were saying. Alex, some cases AM is going to be better, and, it, and some cases where maybe machining is going to be better. It's all about yeah. finding the correct process. You know for <clears> what you want to do. You know it's it, it, yeah that that, that it, it, I, I don't. I don't think it's helpful always to compare the two on on like which one's more energy efficient because actually, you know, if you want to produce a hundred thousand parts, you might want to go injection molding. You know, but if you're only going to produce a hundred, well, why not additive or yeah, you, you, somewhere That's... between you? Maybe you you'd machine it. You just need to pick, I guess, yeah, the right manufacturing process for for the for the application or the the part that you you're you're yeah you're making. And what what about skills, Josh? I mean, uh, yeah, we've got a we've got a huge skills problem in the UK in general. But I mean, how is the the demand for for skills in manufacturing changing due to the rise in in AM? You know, and and what what sort of skills are becoming more valuable? So I, I mean, I think we probably everyone always knows that there's just there's always been a large demand for for skilled individuals within within the manufacturing um, sector. Yeah. Um, I think you know from from the MTA side, it's it's a constant theme that that we see and that we're, we're always looking to address. And I think probably it would be fair to say that sort of the 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 rise of additive technologies added, if you like, another layer on on top of that demand. It would, yeah. it would, yeah, it would be, I think, fair to say. Um, in terms of like what skills, I guess you know, companies are starting to look for it's those it's those design skills um, to take advantage of of what additive can um, can offer. Yeah. Um, you know, you need you need people that have got a knowledge of the processes of, of what it can, what they can and can't do. And I, I mean, this is one of the real um, tricky bits around. I think additive is is that it's not just you know, there's not just one process. You know, there's you've got your FDM, you've got your SLS, you've got your MJF, you've got your electron beam. You know, there's loads of different types of additive, and they all function slightly differently, and yep. they all have different um, um, you know advantages and limitations and things that, that you have to consider when you're designing a part. And and having you know having the unicorn employee that that knows all those different processes and, can, and understand it, you know it it, it it they are hard to find yeah you know they, who can then translate that to a design it's so it's it I, I think it's really yeah it's it's just it's added another layer of of of, of demand to that um, already high demand for for skilled individuals and it's um 
yeah, it, it, it's I think in terms of the skill that's really looking for is people who've got understand the process and can design parts for, for the for the different additive processes. Are, is, yeah, to take advantage of it is, is what what's what's needed at the moment. I suppose it, it sort of plays into the the notion of you know growing your own talent. You know, and, and UK manufacturing, you know, is is a huge you know sort of advocate and, and user of. Uh, the the apprenticeship service you know but with the with the technology moving and advancing so rapidly and regularly hmm. i think it's great that you know businesses are going to be able to get people in um and start training them and, and you know sort of apprenticeships and you know workplace training in additive manufacturing so they're they're in right at the beginning so as things are changing they're learning while it's changing as well rather than maybe you know somebody who's done something for 20 years in a certain process then they've got to retrain um people getting into the industry at the moment where am is already got a foothold but it's advancing as well you know people are people can then move move their skills with it if that makes sense yeah yeah uh, I mean, so one thing i was also going to add um add to that is one of the really i guess one of the really cool things actually about additive is, is it's really accessible yeah so at the bottom end you know the printers aren't you, you can buy you can buy one you you you, you know we could buy one and have it, have it on our desk here you know we could spend i guess five or six hundred you know eight hundred quid or something you could have a printer you know it's not i mean it's expensive but not it's not like trying to buy a um a you know a, a machine tool and connect it up to a three-phase power so like you, you can yeah. have have it there in your home and we found that, I mean, actually, it's interestingly, more from uh, the MTA side and that bit of the background is, is you know, the, the kids today, the 16, 17, 18 year olds, a lot of them have access actually to yeah. the printers. And, you know, the, the stuff, some of the stuff that they're doing is, is, is amazing. Um, it, you know, I, I think back to what I was doing at that age and I'm like, wow, these, like, the opportunities <laughs> that these kids are getting. Yeah. <laughs> much better you know i remember doing my my design technology at, at school and, and sort of the stuff that we had access to was nothing like what they they, they can get access to now um but it, it's uh, you know i think what we're going to see you know, hopefully over the next sort of five ten years is, is these these uh these kids that are coming through who've grown up playing with the technology coming into the workforce and they would have they have a lot of those skills already which will be which i which i think is really exciting actually yeah I, I think it's yeah, a little bit maybe difficult at the moment, but I can you can see that there's it's going to be coming through soon because there's so yeah that that, that technology is, is is being adopted by you know the schools it's been adopted or well, yeah people are purchasing it for their sort of their own interest so it's yeah it's it's a, it's a yeah I think that's what yeah one of the sorry I, I'm waffling a bit but the, the one of the great things about technology is it's just it's just so accessible from from the skill side so that I think yeah the next generation it could, yeah. It, it leaves me feeling very positive about sort of the next generation and what, what what's going to happen. Brilliant, and uh, you know maybe these three uh, D printers that, I, as you say, they are they are becoming more accessible to you know the general public. I suppose um, that could be one of the things that that UK manufacturing is crying out for. To you know, I often have these conversations with people about how can we get more youngsters into manufacturing. Well, here's a prime example. You know, if you've got fantastic technology like 3d printing that that kids can start picking up at an early age even for, you know even if it's not in school if if the family have got a uh you know dad's got a 3d printer in his office or in or in the or in the the garage or whatever and they've got a hobby making little i don't know little toys or ornaments whatever it might be i think that can only help spark that interest of well what, what else are these used for well you know manufacturing what's manufacturing well this is manufacturing you know and then it just we never had anything like that when I was at school. I know we are going back quite a quite a long time, but uh, yeah, maybe it's a really a really cool route into you know getting more kids you know involved in manufacturing in general. So long may that continue. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask you, Josh. Collaboration is always a. I, I mean, it's a, a a fantastic value for anybody to have and for any business to have. I'm always banging on about collaboration, but how important is collaboration between industry? academia and you know that the research institutions in advancing am technologies um i i think probably the, yeah the short answer to that is it's absolutely critical um i think it's it's something that we 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 need um not just actually on a um technology side 
but also on a, on a skill side as well. Um, looking at the um, sort of the technology side, you, you know, you need the academic institutions, you need the research research establishments. They 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 need to be, I guess, sort of pushing the limits of of what's possible um, yeah. with the technology. You know, the idea is that they can help advance the technology so it can continue to overcome those industry challenges. So, you know, you need that that collaboration between industry so that. Uh, yeah, the academia, the the research or, uh, institutions, they're, they're solving those real world industry challenges, you know, which then the industry can use because um, the technology is better. It's doing what it what they need. So you you need it on on that side. But then also, I, th I think you know, industry has the opportunity to feed into ac academia, I guess specifically, and say these are the skills we need. You know, these are the mm. this is uh, this is what, what what we need people to be able to do. Um, so you know, so that the universities can train up. Um, you know the next generation of engineers and scientists um, that are ready to come out actually into into industry. Um, one of the I think great examples I've got this, and it's, uh, it's not actually an additive, additive example, but it's um, I think uh, have you um, heard of the University of Wolverhampton race team at all? Yes, I have. Yes, yeah, I think. I, um, I, yes, I have. James Worthington at my uh, the, the the workwear guy. Uh, yeah, I think yeah. he, he supports that and. Yeah, yeah, maybe Mark Weymouth as well, but yeah, I've certainly heard of it. Oh, that well, I think what they're doing is spot on. Like they, you know, they get the students to participate in in running a, a race team. It's not just you know Formula student. They you know, they've got a Prague car. They've got a couple of Formula Morgans. They get the students to work on them. They tell the students it's their responsibility to get them to the track and back. Yeah, if they, you know, if the students don't do it, then it doesn't happen. You know, the university is really hands off, and it you. you the, the like the amount of success that they've had with people being recruited afterwards is, is phenomenal uh, yeah. you know, they were telling me last time they had one guy who'd been working on their um, i think it was when they were doing their is it i can't remember if it's formula three or formula 3000 car that they had prior to the praga but he came off he basically did control engineering and he'd been running the control system on the car for the last three years yeah he came off, went to went for an interview at mclaren as a graduate control engineer and they offered him the senior engineer's job because he was <laughs> wow qualified. but i it, it just makes sense because the yeah. you know he's been working on it for three years what what a great way of um you know, help, helping make sure that, that they've got the skills. I mean, I, I know at AM, with AM UK, we're we're hope I'm hoping that we can we can put together some sort of you know industry um, academic um, competition where we get the you know students to uh, sort of university students to work on a real real industry challenge rather yeah. than you know, some challenge that we set get get them to work on something that industry is finding a problem. So, I mean, we're we're still very early days in exploring that, but yeah, you know, I think it's such a good template for how how to make sure that people you know get the right skills that when they come out it's it's easy to to get into the sort of the jobs that they that are, you know or get, get into get jobs and and fill sort of the gaps that, that are, are are there in 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 the industry yeah well i look forward to following the the uh the developments in that competition in whatever shape or form that might take that that's an absolutely brilliant idea so what what advice or do you have any advice for for manufacturers who might be looking to adopt am technologies for the first time yeah um so i mean obviously there's there's just, yeah i guess all the traditional stuff i say you know come and speak to am uk we can we can have a chat with you um you can speak to people at the manufacturing technology center or probably any of the high value manufacturing catapults yep you could obviously we've got the um am uk knowledge hub um, at mac 2024 which obviously next year so that people can um yeah, people can come along there. They'll be able to chat to an expert. But um, if I was going to give some, I guess, advice now, it, it would be just start simple. Um, yeah. I, I, know, I know it's not true of everyone, but I've, I've seen so many examples of companies where they've tried to go in that they, oh, let's buy a, this amazing printer and, and it doesn't quite do what they want. And then they yeah. sort of get disillusioned and they don't come back. Uh, so, I, you know, I tell people, go, go in at the bottom end because I've seen actually so many success stories of companies they bought an FDM printer. They've played around with it, stuck an apprentice on it, or, or done something themselves with it, and gone, "Oh, if that this works, I wonder if it can do this." And then you know yeah. they almost you know, create their own business case. Go, "Well, actually, this is amazing." They, and then they buy a more expensive one, and they move up. If you like, move up the technologies. And yeah, it, it, I, I would just yeah go go in simple and 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 almost you know very very low risk option and mess around and see what see what happens um to some extent yeah um, you know it, it's it's amazing i think the 
going back to the accessibility of the, the technology, you know, we've got, we've, I've, we've, I, know, I know we've got a couple of members where they essentially, they started in a garage with a couple of FDM printers, no engineering background. And they, you know, one came from a business consultant, one was from finance. It, it, and they've just, and it, these are you know, big old companies just from, like, yeah. you know, just from essentially messing around. Um, it's so, I, I I would encourage people just to almost yeah to purchase that on the shelf, um, three D printer and and yeah have a have a play and see what almost yeah. see what happens and see see if you can work out what the opportunities are within your business for it. Spark that curiosity. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. Do you think there's any or have you seen maybe from your members or people that you talk to, um, uh, you know, at AM UK uh, around the sort of mindset needed to make that sort of shift to adopting AM technology. I mean, I guess there would be some individuals and businesses that are apprehensive about it, or yeah, you know, I think it's the great unknown for a lot of people, isn't it? You know, it, unless you've seen something or you've um, benefited from it yourself, there's always that sort of element of doubt and uncertainty around how to go about stuff. I mean, do, do you think there's a, a mind shift hurdle for, for for some manufacturers i mean manufacturing is is, is it, it's the world of innovation isn't it you know yeah. manufacturers are great at, at making things happen are great at making things but sometimes you know when it comes to any sort of plant and equipment you know decision decisions uh sometimes are labored on and you know it takes a while for um for things to come to fruition i mean are you seeing any resistance in any parts in terms of you know Dipping, dipping your, you know, dipping your toe in the water, and 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 uh, you know, just trying something for your business. What do you think's the the current scene, you know, in terms of mindset out there? I, I personally don't think there's a much of a mindset issue, actually. Because okay, I think, good, good. Going back, going back to what you said about you know, these companies are generally quite innovative. You know, they, yep. they, they they're used to adopting you know new technology. They buy new machine tools, and the, you know, robotics is starting to come in. So I, don't, I don't, almost don't think that's actually the biggest hurdle. I actually think the hurdle is more around the complexity of the additive like technology landscape. And it's right. Sometimes it's all a bit, bit like, oh, where do I start? <laughs> you know, and bewilderment. I, I, yeah, I think there's just been quite a lot of messaging of you know, come and buy mine. It's the best solution. Come and buy mine. It's <laughs> the best solution. And and it, and because all the you know, because there's, if you like, seven different types of additive at a, a fundamental level, but you can know you could start drilling down into that. It, it make that probably split that even further. In yeah. reality. It, it it makes it really complicated because you're like, which, which one? Because you, you don't want to get um uh, in in you know one ecosystem and go, oh no, I picked the wrong one. Do you, it, yeah, I think that that oft, it's often what you know that probably more what people um you know probably struggle with. Yeah. Um, I, I, think, I remember hearing actually a stat that there was over 150 different types of metal printer on the market currently, and I, I would I would argue that that means there's probably 150 different processes. Yeah, you know, metal processes and probably even more on the polymer side. So it, it I think that probably the, just the complexity of the market probably is is, is probably the biggest hurdle. Yeah, and it, it's almost a bit of a there's needs to from the you know the OEM the technology suppliers of, of, of additive there has to be a big education piece for the supply chain around you know this is what the, what the technology can do this is where this is yeah. where, where you do and don't use it and it's you know maybe maybe sometimes a little bit a bit, bit of honesty actually this is the best solution or yes. this is the best solution and, and it goes back to what I was saying you, you know I, th I think they, they look and they go which one should I adopt and, and I would always say just go and buy a probably an FDM printer and um, have a have a play and see what happens. Yeah, but it's 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 low cost, it's low risk, and it it it's probably not going to do all the things that you would want to do, but it will it will give you a really good starting place with the technology, yeah. and you can work out so you can start to work out actually this is how we want to use it, and actually okay these are the technologies maybe we need to start sort of heading towards. Um, but yeah, I, I do think you know one of the things that we're trying to do with AMU with AMUK will be a, an education piece for the for the supply chain around right. how to you know, what the different technologies are and and how how you know how you might go about about adopting um, ad adopting adopting them. So, I mean that, that that is probably work all in in the future that is going to come out. So we're we're still trying to put that together. Um, but yeah, it's I, I yeah I, I don't think there's a, almost a mind mind 
mindset shift needed. It's more of a, an education piece is needed just to explain yeah. you know, how to go about it, where, where 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 you should should start, versus where everyone else tells you to start. Which I I, I just think it can really it's yeah, it's just a confusing landscape. I think yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So the 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 willingness is there, the inclinations there. It's just that there's so there is so much choice, isn't there? I think that's probably what you're saying. So where where do you start? I, I think yeah. that probably can create a bit of overwhelm yeah. in itself. So uh, yeah, great. So what's what's on the calendar for AM UK over the next sort of twelve months, Josh? Any anything in particular? I know we've got Mac coming up, but anything else? So um, yeah, we've uh, we will be. I mean, we'll be at Autosport. Um, international um, in the in January. Okay, uh, we've got our um, so we've got some members that will will be at that. Um, oh, actually, before that, we've actually got form next coming up um, next month. So we'll we'll uh, just be be there with with um, I guess visiting some members and and, and seeing some of what's going on with the um, in the additive landscape. Um, but yeah, next year we've got our AM UK members forum um, at Trump on the third of March. So that's sort of a uh, I guess a forum where we discuss sort of what's going on with the in the wider additive sector. So we have yeah. people talking about sort of market trends. We'll have um, someone up talking about the technology. Um, we'll also be talking about the um, AM UK strategy actually at, at, that, at that event. So um, the AM UK strategy is a piece of work that we're currently putting together. Um, so we did a survey of the membership um, uh, back in actually in February this year. Um, uh, where we asked, you know, what are the, what are the big challenges your sector's facing? And I, I've, I've now mentioned it a bit a few times through this through the conversation. But essentially, three big themes came out: it was supply chain, and it's how do we educate help educate our supply chain? How do we help them adopt? How do we yep. qualify our supply chain? Um, it was the second one was around skills, and so how do we get the right skilled people in, into place? And the last one was around standards, um, which is you know what. what it was everything from what are what are standards to how do I you know how do I adopt a standard to can, can we cr create some you know standards together so yeah you know, we've got three big pieces of work if you like going on in the background now ar around those three themes we've got members engaged on that so I'm hoping that over the next sort of twelve months we'll be specifically um, yeah sort of working on those topics and hopefully we'll see more events or I guess things pop up from from yeah from those um from those areas um and as you mentioned yeah we've obviously got mac coming up where we've got the am uk knowledge hub um so if people want to visit and um yeah it should be quite an exciting actually mac because i think we've, we're we're on track to have the largest additive zone that we've we've had so it's i think that speaks sort of volumes for how far the technology's come yeah um, I'll, I'll certainly be at mac um i went to the last one and uh yeah uh already registered for uh for mac 24 so definitely looking forward to to seeing the uh the additive manufacturing zone on there fascinating so that pretty much wraps up today's episodes josh so you know uh thank you very much for coming on the show it's been a real pleasure to talk to you about am uk uh hope you've enjoyed our discussion so thanks again to the listeners and viewers thanks again to josh from am uk and look out for the next episode of Insights for Manufacturing. See you next time and bye-bye.